Coming up on this episode of Common Denominator. Every day you're dealing with problems. Every single, there's not a single day. If you're not comfortable, if you're not comfortable and the problems as you grow, the problems get bigger. So you have to say, I am a warrior and I love dealing with issues. Hi, and welcome to Common Denominator, a podcast about growth, mindset, and entrepreneurship. I'm Dave Azer, and once again, the star of the show, your favorite host, Moshe Popak, is sitting right over there in the guest seat, ready to answer your questions about business, real estate. We got some family stuff. We got a whole grab bag of questions that the public must know about you. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. It's been it's been a journey, but I'm I'm great to be back here. Dave, thanks so much again for hosting, giving me giving me the day off. But I appreciate it. Thank well, you. Well, you don't really have the day off because all the heavy lifting is <laughs> going to be you. You got a lot to answer. Okay, first things first. Congratulations, baby Popak, baby number eleven has yeah. joined the family. Well done, well done to your wife. Yeah, very. Um, so thank you so much for that, Dave. Because literally only. Even though um, you know you would think that it would have kicked in, but only the past few weeks, as we're leading up to the birth of baby eleven, like the realization, wow, you have eleven kids, <laughs> right? It was like the first time, and um, I'm just grateful that everyone's healthy, that my wife, wa- my wife's good, and my kids are good, and. Um, and really settling and continue to settle in that organized chaos mindset. So, is your wife at this point just like on autopilot? Okay, baby, no problem. Labor, here we go. Boring. So, um, so no, we've had we've had different journeys through different labors and through different deliveries. But uh, um, I, I mean, she's super strong. Period. Like um, proven time and time again. And we work together. So we work together, run the house together, and. Um, you know, she's a little bit of an anomaly in a way, in a way honestly. <laughs> I would say. Right. Uh, so now that you, you're an expert in both, what's harder, running a business or running a, a family with 11 kids? Mm, I would say I would say because it's more, uh, you have more emotion and more attachment to it. I mean, the business is, becomes part of your life too, but when it's your kids and your wife, I think I think it's more important, the, the family – because you can lose everything, which ha- which could happen in business, but you still, in the end, you still gotta as a as a father, you still gotta worry that these kids are safe. So I would go with the family. Do you ever have a moment in either uh, place, your office or your home, where you go, "Oh, that's a lesson that I'm gonna bring to the other place"? For sure, I. Um, when it comes to, I guess, younger employees, I I learn a lot from my kids. Uh, I mean, I'll be 44 soon, uh, but how to communicate to them. They teach me a lot about technology, a lot of, a lot of ideas and what, what's popular, what's going on to try to, um, to try to get the gambit. Like I could talk to maybe people older. A lot of my business partners are older than me. Um, and then I guess people my age, but then when it comes to younger employees, I definitely learn a lot from my kids. Um, so we have a lot of ground to cover, a lot of questions about real estate, which is your life's work, and then some other sort of general business questions. But you and I were talking before the show, and I think it's super important to talk about the last few months of mm. your life uh, because not it's not only unbelievably interesting and crazy what you've been through, but also I think it informs who you are as a person, your ability to make decisions, how it impacts your business. So if you could give us the sort of Cliff Notes version of the last six, eight months of your life, because it's they should make a movie just on that. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate that, Dave. I mean, uh, definitely, um, and I think that this goes on for every single human, as you try to uh, push limits or push, um, you know, status quo, uh, I guess the universe does test you. And I, I guess I personally was tested. I'm pretty stubborn, so I guess the test had to be pretty intense so I'll just go through a couple things. Um, we have a we have a farm. We have horses. We I was riding on a horse. Supposed to be super tame. We had bought a new uh, saddle. The saddle had uh, had ripped and it hit the horse. The horse was was jumping and it couldn't calm down. And I had to make a decision. And I didn't have a helmet. We were on concrete. So I so I had to jump off that horse. This was about like seven eight months ago. Jump off the horse. Uh, luckily, 
you know, I trained martial arts, so I figured out how to break the fold, but completely black and blue, a lot of my body. Uh, but I was hoping that, you know, the horse wouldn't, uh, wouldn't step on me, right? That's, that's an issue. So that really, like, you know, that's like the um, pretty serious, you know, uh, I guess trauma that has to be worked out. Uh, then I took the whole family. My, my, two of my kids, my 17 and 12 year old told me they don't feel safe going to Israel. Actually, it told me before we went, but we went uh, in September time. We went to went to Israel, um, and then uh, I had actually gotten sick a week before October seven, which was the attacks. So we're traveling with sixteen people, and then I had to make the decision. Uh, the The first day we had flight that night, October seven at night. You know, while the rockets are going on and everything's happening, me as a father, right? I have my wife and my kids. I have to protect and make decisions. I have people that I knew that were speaking to security and they were telling them don't fly. But I knew that every day that I wouldn't, um, there would be um, con continued unknowns. So again, making decisions, it's just make a decision again. Um, and you don't know, right? You don't know. And luckily we, we got home. And then for, um, and then just my health was dwindling. And we had some, got some, I was in the movie, I took the kids to the, to the movies and then I just wasn't able to breathe. My friend took me to the emergency room and had many different viruses inside of me to the extent where my half jokingly, my doctor j joked to me, someone trying to kill you. Like I just had these stuff where for, for two months, I basically, you know, it just wasn't, wasn't a full breath. And, uh, you know, I have a little bit of claustrophobia. So it was, it was a little bit of um, mind over matter. While that's all going on in my, in my business, um, unfortunately, finding out that peop, some people were dishonest to the extent of uh, millions of dollars and so, on some incompetency. So a lot of changes had to happen. Um, and then my wife being pregnant in our, thir in our third trimester with our 11th child and processing that. And the number one lesson, I'm glad that you asked this, so wh whoever's listening is the idea that all of these things could be happening. And I always remember this. This too shall pass. It's super important to have that deep ingrained in your DNA. And also, uh, everything is for the best. But you have to not say it. You have to really, really live that. So you're responsible. Again, you know, we have a few hundred employees, my wife, my kids. So it, it doesn't, you have to go to that place where it doesn't really matter. All these things are happening. And um, it's really surrender. And today, um, I'm in better health. Thank God, and uh, my wife, my child, and my family are all healthy, and we've, uh, we're have on the men's, on the business side, but it was tremendous to get comfortable with loss. That's the lesson that I take over these months, that it's impossible. If you want to achieve, um, you know, you strive for high things, 100% of the time, there will be losses, there will be stuff, and my grandfather used to say, as long as you win your entire life, win more than you lose, you're doing tremendous. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I already knew it. And then just to hear it again, all in a row, it's stunning. Any one of those things in and of themselves would be traumatic. And then you just add them all together. So I know, you know, I know your process. I know that you're pretty even keel and level headed. I know martial arts is, is a big part of your life and I, and mm -hmm. I get it. I'm just curious though, cause I don't want to make it sound like, well, you just do some deep breathing and everything's fine. I mean, did you have some tough times mentally like, yes you made it through and yes you persevered and yes you're a better person for it but there had to be some days where you had a little bit of the why me thing going on a hundred percent your mind uh you got to go minute by minute second by second there could be moments where it's really dark where you're like in this certain space um because you're weak in other words I, uh, the hardest thing was seeing my wife um because we had we had some tough times in birth nine and ten and uh, I didn't expect to have an 11th child, but she got pregnant. And here I am completely physically not able to take care of her. And all I am, I'm holding the space and I'm hoping that she'll be healthy. She'll be healthy, the baby's gonna be healthy. And, um, and basically the only thing you left, you just like basically surrender. So, so definitely you go through that. And I think of habits and rituals for when the tough times come. What shapes you? It's only that. I always say, and even in business, I tell all the employees, like, let the good things take care of themselves. Train yourself 
to have an easy, flexible way when it comes to the tough times. Constantly mm. speak to each other, collaborate, and there's enough brains, and um, and we'll do the best we can. We had a, you know, we taped an episode before, and we were talking about, especially now, and since COVID, so many unknowns. Everyone's making believe and posturing. They know nobody knows anything. You know, that's the truth. Um, you know, we have so many protocols and systems and that are being shattered. You know, everyone's just like at tipping points. You know, you look at, you look at things that are going on in leadership and government and throughout the world. And, you know, wars happening, but not to be negative because on the other side of it, like right now I'm on the other side of it, you know, the tremendous feeling of gratitude that I have, right? I just have like, and, and the gratitude comes from nothing, just being. I don't even need anything, just being and breathing. Imagine that space. I remember Eckhart Tolle, um, he fell into a deep depression and he was sitting on a park bench. And it was really dark, he was saying. And all of a sudden in a moment, he had nothing, nothing going on. And in a moment, just this overwhelming sense of gratitude that stayed with him for a couple of years. He became a motivational speaker, wrote books. Um, and it's really the power of the mind. It's really the power of the mind um, in personal life and in business. Um, you have to be super comfortable with change. Yeah. And so to put a kind of a bow on this, it's funny because I was about to ask you what you're grateful for and you, you beat me to it. Um, but I'm curious with everything that happened and everything that you took from it, what, what would be one thing that you have learned going forward now to work on your physical health? Because this impacted your physical health to the point where you said you couldn't breathe, you were in the hospital. Um, you have a high stress life with running a business and a family um, and you got sick. Right. So now as you as you're able to have a little bit of space and look back at a little bit, the next time things start to happen to you, what are you going to do differently to stay healthy? And I ask you, but I think it's applicable to everybody. We've all got stuff. So maybe you can give a lesson to people on on how to manage their health. Well, if we realize, I'll tell you something, uh, many things I'll work on, let's just say, take business wise, and many of them don't work out. Um, and the things that do work out are the things that I've put very little effort it's strange how that actually works. And many successful entrepreneurs that I've spoken to, it's exactly that. You set up systems and you're working this way and you're spending all this time. Just yesterday, I was finding myself um, going back into an old rhythm, which I had promised in 2024 I would not, which was boom, 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 efficiency, you know, maxing out. And then I realized, I'm like, Yafa, I'm like, I gotta go upstairs. And I just literally laid down on my carpet, on my floor, and just took an hour and just meditated to bring down because um, I've made that commitment that I have to be available for the people that I love and that I care about, and um, and I and I want to be healthy. It's like you have to choose to be healthy and um, mentally, physically, emotionally, and that and that is my top priority. Um, more money, less money doesn't matter mm. at this point. Um, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen tough stuff, so I don't I don't uh, want to do that anymore like that's not fun yeah and you got a lot of little league games and school plays and <laughs> recitals to attend that's so right. yeah well well glad you're on the mend hopefully thank you good good better times ahead and um thank you. you know and hopefully a year from now we could talk about what an uneventful year you had <laughs> by comparison all right so let's dive into the business stuff and we gotta we got some viewer questions as we always do and when i saw this one i was like oh we gotta ask this because you talk about this a lot you are a contrarian in business mm -hmm. you talk about it um you've given us examples for people who are new to the show maybe don't know tell us why being a contrarian is so important to you and maybe give us an example or two of how it's helped you in business so in the nature of um, of systems, uh, you know, if you're going to follow, oh, you know, the Wall Street Journal says this, or CNBC says this, oh, and this is so popular. If you're going to follow that, in the nature of it being popular, more and more competition, which equals, from a business perspective, what's what's important is the result, the return. So if you're going to follow what everybody else is doing your returns are gonna diminish and there's gonna be a lot more competition. But, so the only other way is to go the opposite way and to train yourself to be comfortable when there's high pressure, everyone says you're nuts, to go that way. Um, and then you'll see outsized returns if you're right. So you have to pull a trigger um, and move that way. When I did my first real estate deal, maybe I've talked about it on the show, I don't remember, but um, I put all my savings down 
and uh, we were non-refundable on a deal. My wife was panicking, my mother-in-law panicking. And then one day before we closed, my wife's like, oh, let's go to the chief of police. Maybe we get some insight in the area. He's like, the guy, the chief of police, he's like, take your money, run away. Um, you know, there's drugs here, there's shootings. It's terrible. I, and what am I? I'm a kid. I'm pale. You know, my wife's panicking more because she came with me. My mother-in-law, I come home to hear, to hear the story. And, um, and we jumped in. I, I had no choice because it was all our savings, all my wedding money, all, uh, you know, um, every, every single dollar that I've saved up, boom, we put it down. And um, looking back now, so what happened? 1030 at night for $300 knocking on doors, collecting rents. I had a business plan. So what I was going to do is, you know, I burned the boat that got me there. So that's what it is. It's being contrarian, but following through with action and execution. So you have something in your mind. You create something in your mind. You have to drive it and drive and drive it till it happens. And then after, after a few months, all of a sudden, the business plan is working. We see profit. We see some profit. After a few months, we refinance and then rinse and repeat. And that's how we grew our business. Now, just fast forward to now. Um, on the last show, I said, will I be courageous enough to buy office buildings in this environment? You're hearing all over the news now, Wall Street Journal, CM, everywhere, um, Fox News, uh, where banks are taking baths and, and issues with the loans that they gave for office buildings. Um, so I'm in contract now uh, uh, on an office building. Uh, and again, it's always about the price you pay. It's a very, you know, discounted price. And I'm taking a bet that, you know, it's here in Florida. So I believe that's a better environment than New York and Chicago and California. And it's a contrarian perspective. Why? Because I'm speaking to bankers. Many banks are like, no, I'm not going to fund you. I found, I found a lender that's going to give me a mortgage, but um, because, of, because of track record. But if you take that, um, the hope, and what we've seen, which I saw when we first started, I'm getting offers much, much higher. I still have the property that I first bought. Um, so I'm still seeing, you know, I'm seeing that that actually panned out. So if you constantly do that, you can have compounding, compounding returns. So you have to get comfortable with that if you want, um, if you're, if you want a life of outsized returns yeah. or... Uh, one more question on that, and then actually we do have a question specifically about office space and purchasing commercial real estate, so it actually makes perfect sure. sense. But just um, one more about contrarian. Do you think that most successful entrepreneurs are contrarians? And sort of part two to that is, are you born with it? Can you become one? Is it in your DNA? Can anyone become a contrarian, or do you need that sort of inner workings to do it? Uh it has to be a con contrarian, but you also have to you also have to be a little bit of a warrior. Um, there's not a single day. I was just talking to my wife and I. We we're just talking to my son. You know, he has the real estate bug. He's almost 18, and every day you're dealing with problems. Every single there's not a single day. If you're not comfortable, if you're not comfortable, and the problems as you grow, the problems get bigger. So you have to say, I am a warrior. And I love dealing with issues. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean they're not solutions. You're a puzzle solver. You're a problem solver. You're a yeah. problem solver. That's right. what you are. You love to solve. Um, are, you, are you that guy? Like, uh, do you have to do a, a Sudoku or a, <laughs> or a jigsaw puzzle if you see what? <laughs> no, so I, so I, lo I, I love that. I love, um, I love really complicated stuff and figuring it out. And I love to build things from scratch, from nothing. Yeah. So I, 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 uh, you know, and when everybody tells me no, I I'm immediately yes, and I'm immediately driving the other way. So, so I guess that's just that's just what it is because, and it just happened to become that way really because I said to myself, you know what, I have this family, I have these things, and I really I really want to be able to take care of them, right? And I'm like, okay, you know, this is what school is, this is health insurance, this is this, you know, and I'm like. I, I love kids and I want to have a big family and, um, you know, I want, so how do I do that? So I got to work backwards because I've said on the show, I'm not, my personality is not really, 
I don't see myself as like this business business person. It happens to be, I'm looking back now, it's like, oh, we kind of grew a pretty big company, but yeah, you know. Well, you also have 11 kids, which means you could just turn them into a soccer team <laughs> or an NFL team. Right. You know, you could just be a GM of your kid's team. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That'll be a lot of fun, actually. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. And it's funny because I have a really good buddy who's super successful. Um, as a hedge fund manager, and he is the kind of guy that will go anywhere and he'll fix a non-existent problem. He's like, no, I don't like the way they're doing this. Here's here's how I. He can't stop fixing stuff. Right? Are you are you like that too? Like you'll go to the airport, you go to a restaurant, you go no, they're doing this wrong. Right. So I I will I will see I will see I will see things, but I've accepted. Um, that's also super important. Picking your battles, picking your battles. You have to know where you are, and is it is it going to move the ticker? So, so you get comfortable, yeah, oh, that's government or that's that, you know, right. it's like, yeah, that's always going to be that way. <laughs> but, but then you spend your energy really, really focused. You know, there's this goal. You have to always make sure your foundation is solid, right? The things, the things that you're managing, the assets that you're managing. And then on growth, you have to make sure, does this, um, is it going to move the ticker and does it further the mission of our company? Does okay. it further the mission? All right. So let's, let's. Get back into the commercial real estate space. A, a question from a viewer was, what are some factors to consider specific to purchasing commercial real estate? What, what should you be looking for? I think, I think it comes down to two main points because in all real estate, you can, you can make money. It doesn't matter where the economy is. Um, I like thinking about location. So if you have a good location, that means that what does it mean look good location there's a lot of people there a lot of transportation uh there's not too much crime um and the better of that you know the better odds um that the property will appreciate and if the property appreciates that's where you make your money and the other side is um is the price you're going to pay so my the way i look the way i look at something no matter where it is like if you know, if I'm buying it, if, it's a, if it was a dollar and I'm buying it for 50 cents, right? I'm like, okay, that's something to really to really consider. Most deals, I say no to. Most deals are from brokers, from different places. So you got to be very, uh, very disciplined uh, to the fundamentals, which is how do I see for our organization, um, can I bring value and create value from this thing? So you have to... You have to say, okay, this is, you know, we're not in, our business is not in the hotel space, so it'll be much more challenging for me to buy a hotel asset. We have a completely vertically integrated system for multifamily, for assisted living, and for office. So if it's big enough and the price is good enough and it's in a location that we can manage, we're going we're gonna to move, try to move very fast. What about tenants? Do you, do you talk to tenants in advance? Do you take a look at like who's rent? Who's on, on the commercial side, yes. On, yeah. the, on the office side, yes, we do. Uh, we want to get a sense, especially now, because a lot of tenants are downsizing. They're renegotiating. There's a lot of movement. And so you, when you're doing your financial model, you have to not be uh, optimist or pessimist. You have to be realist realist on on these are the leases these are the obligations and then and then you have to say okay you know what 60 percent are going to stay 40 percent are going to go or some number that's conservative you have to be very very conservative with the underwriting and if that conservative number works then it's a go if the numbers i always say if the numbers work you have to be good at the math if the numbers work then you go for it and again real estate is a long-term hold that's the other side so to that it's funny because i was I yeah. knew you were going to say that because yeah. I know you say that. Yeah. But even though you feel that way, when you purchase, do you have an exit strategy in mind? I do say that I have sold some. I have sold some. If I've gotten um, some crazy offers in a short period of time, I've sold in order to do something called a 1031 exchange. So usually if you sell uh, a stock or a bond or an asset, usually you usually have to pay taxes. But with the federal co code called 1031 exchange, you're able to take them by like kind exchange other real estate. So I would sell it, not pay tax, and roll it into a new piece of real estate. So I've done that a few times to like, if you're upgrading. That's great, that's a yeah. great takeaway. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Another series of questions had to do with technology. And so I'll just sort of ask you the blanket question, which is how is technology changing real estate? Is it for the better or for the worse? So I think that um, 
people say that real estate is a, even today it's a it's a it's a it's a dinosaur industry, right? Um, there's two areas of technology um, that I like, but it's it's slow to get adopted. I always think you have to have you know the management software, you know technology. We can have apps in your phone. You're able to get get efficiencies as far as operations. One of the things that I would love to see, but that's actually hard to to get these things actually adopted on a mass scale. Because again, it's an older, uh, it's an older industry. But uh, what I would love to see, which is super hard lift, so if anybody hears this and can get it done, is where you can use the blockchain uh, for, um, for real estate ownership. So let's just take it for example. You have, uh, you have real estate coin, right? Real estate coin, and people from all over the world is a piece of property in Miami Beach, and and uh, a million people own a small piece, and it's represented by this token. And you're able to trade the tokens, and and as everything's documented on a blockchain, uh, you're, you'd be good with that. I think I think because because there's no way the way it's set up, the systems are set up that um, everything has to be documented within the technology. So it's like um, if you look at like Bitcoin, it's uh, it's verified. The honesty, and so you can get rid of title insurance. So I'd love to see that, so people can have ownership stake, and they can also give loans, and they can make interest. You know, let's say a thousand people gave a million dollars, right, and they're getting paid interest through some tech system. It'll be super cool. Yeah, it would to be see super that. cool. Well, yeah. I was I was working on it, but uh, <laughs> it's a long journey, and it'll be hard to uh, adopt. Yeah, but. Um, like electric vehicles, I think eventually these things happen. Or AI, right? Yeah, yeah. No, that is that's a really cool premise. Yeah. Um, all right, good. Uh, you know, um, thinking about tech as we're talking about real estate, I was I just was thinking about the movie Moneyball. I don't know if you ever saw it. It's mm. a baseball movie, but it's. Uh, I think I saw yeah. it. I don't recall too much, but so it's a story of the Oakland A's based yeah. on how they built their team mm. based on analytics. Mm. They brought in like an analytics mean. team because they didn't have the money to compete. Brad with, Pitt. Uh, Brad Pitt. Brad yeah, Pitt. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they didn't have the money to compete with the Yankees of the world, so they what did they they do they leaned into metrics and analytics and they built a team good enough to get to the playoffs didn't win the world series but you know but a good team nonetheless mm -hmm. so i'm curious um you know how how heavily do you and your team lean into analytics as opposed to gut feeling what's the ratio there when you're sizing up a property it's um first step uh has to be analytics uh the f when, I, when i talk about the word fundamentals uh, um, I was always taught the math never lies, but the math, garbage in, garbage out. It has to be good math. It has to be, it has to make sense. And the number one metric is like, okay, it's something called IRR, which is internal rate of return. I can put my dollar into place A, B, C, or D. And I keep using this example because it's so true. Kevin O'Leary says, each dollar is a soldier. They go out in the morning, and they come back at night, and they have right um, booty that they've captured. If you want to call it that, um, and and that's really what in the business box. It's not charity. It's not family. In the business box, you have to think of investments that way. You have to think of okay, I'm taking this money, and um, it's gonna like I said, it can go here, there, uh, you know. But the more risk right, which is that nature of the contrarian, but it's calculated risk. So people would look at me, they're like, oh my God, you're nuts, but I have a lot of experience, but also I'm, I'm hedging and I'm doing an analysis for worst case scenarios. For example, I'll buy something 60% occupied, let's say a multifamily, but I, and in a different state, but I'm buying it cheap enough and then I have in the operate, literally in the operating expenses line item for mismanagement and another line item for theft. Yeah. I'm like, okay. And even if those things happen, right? It's like, oh my God, that's a terrible area. And it's just not. No, you calculate it in your calculation. And you know what? If you can come out clean, then that's it. That's the only thing that matters. So I think, um, I think that people probably have no idea what it takes to run a multifamily mm. building, right? Like the day to day, you must get <laughs> you know, hey, apartment 204, <laughs> you're never going to believe what happened to their parakeet. <laughs> apartment 506, all of the walls have been burned. Like, you must just... Right. Man. So so that's why, that's why, if you're going to get into the multifamily business, even though it's hard, but if you 
parlay friends and family's money and and try to try to raise any um, you know other people's money to syndicate it's called syndication when you put other people's money together and start with 150 units why do i say that if you start with four or eight units here's the thing you'll have two people um, that aren't paying you'll have two people and two apartments that are vacant all of a sudden you only have four apartments that are coming in but every month you have bills you have insurance you have taxes you have water and sewer so when you have a bigger machine, you can have a leasing office and you can have enough money for payroll. You have enough money for people to help you on the ground. So therefore you can do, you can do many other deals. So you have to go, it seems scary, plus the capital markets, which is who gives you the money, the banks, they're more willing to do larger deals. That's mm -hmm. a fallacy. The bigger the deal, first of all, less competition, and it's much easier to get debt on the on the bigger deals. Do you also do any diligence on other uh, apartment buildings in the area? What their occupancy is, For what sure. the amenities they have, et cetera. That's part of the due diligence. When you when I buy and I go into new area or, or any area, I always do market studies and I make sure that the comps, that's super important, um, is it a real comp? You gotta walk the comps, yeah. you gotta see it. You gotta see the tenant base. You gotta see, you know, what's the condition? They have a pool. What's the amenities? What's the, is it really, really apples to apples? And then coupled with a gut instinct, you're like, okay, you know, they're getting a thousand dollar rent. I think we get eleven hundred dollars or whatever it happens to be. And you have this instinct, knowing also who's going to be your manager on the ground. Yep. What kind of personality do they have? Do they have that New York personality where they're driving, 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 or is it some more laid back? Man, that's, that makes an, a important, that's an important hire. Yeah, you don't want to get that higher wrong, right? It's super important. I've got, I've, I've, I've had really great. I, you got everything, right? You, you know, run a, you know, a lot, a lot of different assets, and sometimes you'll have superstars, right? It's like bam, bam, bam every year. They're killing it, and then sometimes you don't. And then in the end, that's where you diversify. Sometimes you win more. <laughs> sometimes you win less. It's, uh, it's not for the faint of heart, but, but it is, in America today. Uh, I, I, I said this before. 70% of worldwide wealth, it's $400 trillion market, 400 trillion. The stock market today is a little over 40 trillion. Real estate is 400 trillion. Homes, office buildings, industrial hotels, it's 400 trillion, 100 trillion in the US. Mm -hmm. So everyone's running this way. You know, they ask Willie Sutton why he robs banks. Okay, I always I say this joke because it's so true. And they finally, you know, they caught him after many years. And the investigator asked him, "Said because that's where the money is, right? <laughs> right? That's that, right? That that that's the end of the day. That's that's where it is. That's where wealth is. People sell businesses, stuff like that. What do they do? Many people they've sold their things and they come to me to to invest with me and things like that. But in the end, that's that's what it is. People own homes, right? And that's what it is. They're taking out home HELOCs, home equity lines of credit. They're that's the salvage of that. Or you're investing with a money manager." into stocks and bonds, which is all over the place. You don't yeah. even know. You don't know up or down. But if you own a piece of real estate in your name, it's a little different. So, and that's perfect, because uh, that leads us right into our last batch of questions about home ownership. Um, and, and this is a really neat one. The concept of buying an existing home versus building a new home. Um, and if you have a choice of the two, obviously money, let's, let's maybe take money aside for a second. Do you think there's a particular um, benefit either way? Like, would you rather buy something that, so that already exists or build something new, again, provided you can afford to do either of the two options? Well, I dealt with that exact issue. Uh, we were living somewhere and it was, uh, as our family was expanding, it was getting Your a little- Your family's always expanding. Uh, this is true. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, uh, yeah. So married, married almost 19 years. My wife has been pregnant or nursing the entire time. <laughs> That's the, that's the story. Would you give that woman a break, please? <laughs> that's the story there. I know, right? So, so a friend of mine, uh, uh, we were going to rent in a certain area, and he said, no, there's a house already that exists um, that you should buy. So I walked in, and we, we, ended up, we ended up buying that house. But the alternative would have been um, that we would have spent, it would have taken, based on finding land, if we were to build a house, Finding land, permits, getting it, dealing with contractors over time, over money, getting it furnished till we move in and our family dynamic probably would have been four years. Oof. 
So you asked me if you can buy ready-made and even if, like I said, I've said this before, it's like, you know, make 10 offers in a community that you want to be, 70 cents in the dollar now. And so I think someone will bite and then you take that extra 30% and you put it into a beautiful new kitchen, flooring, bathroom, and all of a sudden you got yourself a nice house. Yeah. Right? That's the play now. Two years from now, when interest rates come down on the mortgages, you just refinance. And, I, and when I saw that question and I thought I'd ask you that, I started looking it up and going down the rabbit hole a little bit. And one thing that I read that I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense, that a home that already exists comes with landscaping that's already mm. beautiful and, you know, f um, I guess vibrant, right? I didn't even think that that's yeah. like an added bonus. Now, all that all that is is there. And sometimes, um, you know, you, just have, you have to do your due diligence before you buy an existing home right. to make sure, you know, that, that things are copacetic, but... Yeah. Um, but that's, you know, but that's, that's the way to do it. It's always, again, always on that buy. You just got to buy. And now's the time to do it. Um, a lot of, a lot, unfortunately, a lot of people are having a tough time right now. And, um, and people are going to be making moves. People are, people are moving. It's a little less maybe in Florida because a thousand people are moving every day to, to yeah. Florida. <laughs> Net right. migration in 2023. But, um, uh, you know, but yeah, uh, the drive the drive from Miami Beach where we are now to where I live is getting longer every day. Oh, so yes. people could slow down the moving, <laughs> yeah. the traffic. It's yeah. it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. I know um, originally from the Northeast, and every day, yeah. every day, people are moving. So, uh, well, thanks, man. Thanks for this, as always. Pleasure. As yeah. we say goodbye, I think the question that America really wants to know is, nine boys and two girls, um, how do you keep making so many boys? <laughs> Why do you keep making so many boys? Honestly, um, I thought, you know, uh, we just had my daughters, my younger daughters. So I have a 14-year-old, and I have a, a girl who, who turned nine. And she was always, like, so sweet, and, nice, and we just had a birthday party for her. And all of a sudden, this, like, energy came out of her. No, we're going to do it this way. I'm like, wow. I'm like, it's so interesting. Girls and boys, how do I make, how do I ma make more boys? <laughs> Honestly, you're asking, you're asking a good question. Um, I'm grateful that they're all healthy. Yeah, Let's sure. put it that way. Sure. Um, honestly, that's, that's where I am. And I, I just hope everyone's going to be safe and good. And, um, and we, keep on, we keep on doing good things. Well, it's always a pleasure sitting with you. And uh, you get to take this seat back next yeah. week. And you're talking with Joshua Aaron, who is an international music star. And I know that that's going to be a, one that you're looking forward to. I definitely am. And, um, you know, he is uh, really an amazing journey. And I love music. Uh, not that I can sing or play piano, but I've been working on my commitment from a year ago uh, on the piano side. But, um, but I just love music and people... Uh, should really give a lot of respect for musicians because yep. they go actually people don't know this they go through a lot to finally get um, to where they are but I'm excited about that well wonderful and uh, just a, a quick mention that if you have not already done so uh, please subscribe to Moshe's YouTube channel uh, you can watch all of these episodes and if you prefer to listen to podcasts you can subscribe on Apple and Spotify and leave ratings and reviews and uh, I think that's it anything else to add before we say goodbye no just everybody should be well that's all okay. and everything should be good <laughs> there that's it is it. thanks buddy see you again soon thanks so much Dave